Hi, Kent. Hi, Ellen. Hey, Freeman. Get my phone off. Oh, there we go. All right. Yeah. Back problem still. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's a drag. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Ning, ning. Hello, everybody. Hi, Brian. Hey, Brian. Brian. We're in my new office, which is the basement. <laughs> Looks nice. Yeah, it's, it's a nice basement. <laughs> is it cold? It's bright. Uh, it's, it's a little cooler, but I'm going to fix that light. Hold on a second. It's a little bit annoying. That might be better. That's it's the start of hoodie season. Yeah, I love hoodie season. I love just wearing sweaters and that kind of stuff. So it's like a t-shirts. Um, I'm glad the internet works down here as well. So great. <laughs> How's everyone? I got home like two minutes ago. Perfect. Yeah. Danielle texted, I'm sure Freeman let everybody know that she's running a little late. I didn't have a chance yet, so thanks. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> that's going on with that. Um, yeah. We got some things to, we got Mina, Kim coming on. We got Eamon here. Mina, Kim, what up? Hello, I can't. Hi, everyone. Hola, how you uh, doing? I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> mm. Yep. How about you? Me, uh, I'm dealing with back pain right now. So if you see Ooh. wincing, it's from from my back. Oh, I've no. got a chiropractor, a body worker, and an acupuncture working on me. So, oh, one of them's gonna get the breakthrough. Yeah, and maybe some better weather. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if it's raining yeah, over there. I don't there, know but about it's... that, right? <laughs> oh. Is it, yeah, we have the. I think was it record rainfall? Yeah. Kent, is your back pain chronic? Is it something that you it, It's relatively new. Okay. Uh, mostly do. I mean, I lost a really good friend. Um, it was in bad shape when we drove to Ohio and back, and I slept on a blow-up bed for five days because the other uh, place to sleep was soft as a, I don't know, a jello mold or something. So Man. it just, I came back all screwed up. And so, you know, I'm trying to work my way out of it so it doesn't stay chronic. Yeah. That's the point. Sorry to hear about your loss. Yeah, thank you. It's a dear, dear friend, 81 bone cancer. It went pretty quickly, sadly oh. enough, but his wife and I are really good friends and they were together 31 years. I can't even imagine what that's like. That's you know and so sorry to hear that yeah several of us have been hanging out with her and trying to move through that you know speaking about loss and longevity my mother's younger brother's wife passed away um last weekend i'm sorry and um <clears throat> i've known her all my life uh and I just found out that she's married. She's she was married for seventy one years. I thought she was married when I was born. I'm going to be seventy three. They were they've been married for they were married for seventy one years. Speaking about hard to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. Wow, That's incredible. Mm -hmm. What are you eating, Jesse? Mm -hmm. I gotta make this better. Amy made a uh, really great 
<clears throat> nectarine and cabbage salad. That sounds yummy. Oh, wow. With a what? Buttermilk dressing? Feta, 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 feta buttermilk. Yeah, that's good. I miss y'all cooking. I really do. <laughs> um, let's see. I'll be right back. I gotta get some water. Is it still peach season over there or has it ended? Um, peaches are gone. Peaches there are, are some, gone. there are still some stone fruit around. I think uh, plums are still available. It wasn't a great, a great uh, stone fruit season. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. All the big hits this summer have been ruined by the rain. Yeah. I had, I had some amazing peaches um wendy and i we had an interesting episode with our uh, our car we went up to visit our son to uh dog sit for their puppy and uh, he's in burlington vermont we were heading up 91 and uh a turkey vulture smashed into our windshield uh which was oh incredibly gosh. bizarre uh we were all okay the windshield needed to be replaced and they couldn't find one but once they did find one, we went up the next weekend to get our car and we were took it, decided to take a leisurely trip through Vermont back, something we've been thinking about for a long time. And we went across the Lincoln Gap, which goes through the, the um, I guess it's a national forest there. And in the middle of nowhere, toward the western side of the gap, we came across a guy with a stand of, of, and he was selling peaches, white peaches. He said it was the end of the season. Most of his peaches he delivered, but he was just getting rid of them. And they were, they were except they were the best peaches that I had all, all summer. They were really good. I'm glad you're okay, despite the vulture. <laughs> Yeah, I keep, you know, I keep replaying. What could I have done differently, you know? I mean, here's this vulture. This vulture is, I mean, I see it. I'm, I'm on the road. I'm on 91. It's a two-lane road. And um, the, the turkey vulture is in the middle of the two lanes eating some roadkill. And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to take off. I mean, he, hears, he sees me coming. He knows I'm coming. And I was probably, you know, maybe 100 yards, maybe a little more when I noticed it. And I keep saying that to myself and he doesn't go, doesn't fly. And there's a car behind me, not that far behind me. So I don't want to stop quickly. Um, and then, then just as we got there, he took off and smashed right into the windshield. Wow. It was bizarre. And I keep thinking, could I have gone to the right? <laughs> could I have gone to the left? You know, but my mind wasn't able to process it fast enough. It was bizarre. On a lighter note, it reminds me of a Seinfeld episode <laughs> where George hits a he George hits a bird, but he keeps on saying that the birds have a contract with him that they always get out of the way, like you're saying. <laughs> like the bird's supposed to get out of the way. It's like the contract, and then the bird broke the contract, and uh, yeah. So yeah, sorry you had that that. Uh, incident that's terrible danielle mm. just joined she looks refreshed and ready to go haha um okay so i can oh, share okay. my screen do we want to share screens with the, the the agenda or should we just everybody has it because i emailed it do have mm -hmm. have you have you opened the meeting not yet we've okay. just been chatting um let me see what our numbers are like i'm pretty sure we don't have a quorum today um just from one two three four five six seven well if Lori is on medical leave then we might have a quorum oh that's true Are you able to submit the budget section, Brian? Just want to check on that. 
I have the not, I haven't had, I, I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't attempted again, but I could do that while we're, if there's some time No right rush now. on it. I just wanted yeah, yeah. to check. <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't really worked on it um, at all since we had that issue. Um, I, I'll just try to open it up with maybe different browsers and things. Um, so one, two, Six, seven, eight. Okay. Oh, we got somebody calling in. Hi, it's Tulani. Hey, hey, hey Tulani. Hi. Hi, sorry, calling in. Yeah, we, I'm still at work. That's okay. We do have a we we do have a quorum, which is great. Okay. Great. I'm gonna thanks mute for, myself, but I'm here. Thanks, cool. Tulani. Thank you. So somebody can move to open meeting. I'll move to open the meeting. Anyone want a second? Seconded. <laughs> Great, thank you. So pursuant to um, Mayor Narkowitz's stay at home emergency order, which I don't know if that is still what we are reading from, but pursuant to the regulations in place, uh, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. And for minute keeping it as 712. Um, so we've also we've narrowed the, the focus of this meeting really to include three agenda points. Before we move into them, um, has have folks had a chance to review the minutes? Can I'm we just reading them now? Um, would anyone like to move to approve them or do we wanna wait until the end of the meeting to, to do that in case others join on? Brian has shared the agenda in the chat, everyone. Um. Well, why don't we? Why, why don't I move to approve the minutes and see if anybody has any questions? Since we have a quorum, I second to approve the minutes. Okay, all in favor of approving the minutes. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five. Amen and Tulani, are there any votes on the minutes from y'all? Aye. Six, aye. Any abstentions? Any nays? Okay. I'm not a voter, so. Yep. Minutes are to let Minna know. Yeah. Minutes are approved. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Did we ever approve the minutes from, I don't know, two months ago <clears throat> when we said that we were going to table them? I don't remember if that ever happened or not. I don't think it did. So that's a good point. Um, uh, <clears throat> you think it's a good time to bring them up because everybody hasn't really reviewed them and, and they're refreshed, but I can I can share them in the chat and then people can look at them and approve them if possible. That's a good point, uh, Jesse. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, do, yeah, do you want to share them in the chat and maybe we can do it before we um, adjourn? Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so the th we have three agenda items tonight to really look closely at the first, well, I'll, we can discuss the order. It's We have updates from public art, which I think is continued conversations. We have updates from the equity committee, which is continued some continued conversations. And then we have updates on the biennial, which is some updates and some new conversations that we've been kind of trying to have via email. So I guess I'm wondering like where people feel energized to start. We don't need to move alphabetically through this. Do you want to put time limits on on things? 
Just curious. I, I feel like the uh, biennial issues are very, there's two issues that are very different. One is just the practical things of getting our biennial launched. And the other is the, you know, question about the work itself. So, um, I would like to maybe ask that we wait on the biennial a little bit. I think that there may, might be a community member who wanted to come speak during the meeting. I don't know if we already missed the public comment portion where that would fall, but his comments, I think, were in regard to the biennial. So I, I'm not sure if he's going to be available, but wanted to give him a little more time to get here before we launch into that if possible. He came in early and then he left and I'm emailing him the link again right now and I'm telling him that yeah. we're all here, okay? Yeah. Okay. Jason. Yeah, yeah, because he emailed me and said he's coming, so. Or okay. texted me rather. I think it's fine to have public comment when we get to that section. We can have, is that okay, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. Great. I, I think he should be part of the conversation. I don't think it has yeah. to be like, a, yeah. you know, that's how I normally do it. We, you know, people, we have open public public comment that we usually do, but I think we more incorporate the community members into our conversations. Uh, and it's a little less formal than city council. Great, so I'm fine with holding off on the biennial conversation unless there's anything well, we can just hold off the entire biennial conversation. Um, would anyone, would anyone either from equity or public art like to start one of those conversations? Yeah, um, I'll start the equity conversation. Um, we have had four of us actually met once to Talani, Dana, Jesse, and I to discuss this. And my feeling, and I'm just going to be as I'm trying to be kind about this, but at the same time, I'm really adamant. It is my firm belief that folks of color, that BIPOC folks need to lead this discussion. And that one of the, one of the points is what's being offered in terms of training as we sort through how many layers we have to sort of move through with this. I mean, you finally have two folks of color on the NAC, and I believe we are the very first. I may be wrong, but my understanding is that there are there have been others, Brian? Okay, we are the existing ones at this point. Mm -hmm. There was in the folder for past work being done with equity was almost nothing. I am speaking now as someone who has been in this work for over 15 years. I've been an independent, um, anti-racist consultant professionally for almost six years. And the folks that have been offered up, A, are young women of color by themselves, which is a dangerous situation to send into an almost all white committee anyway. It puts them at extreme danger. And two, each of them have cited that this is not their primary work. They are one, you know, without outing anybody's name, but one is a real estate agent primarily who works with co-op stuff. The other is an artist who works with trying to deal with resilience and bringing people together. This organization needs to dig deeper first before we talk about bringing folks together. My sense is that the equity committee is taking its time because we have a very deep dive and it is my request I'm going to ask that we folks of color are the ones who lead this rather than it being led by white folks who don't know what you don't know. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just stating the fact and that if we are uplifting the voices of BIPOC artists and BIPOC orgs that are art orgs, we need to understand from a very deep level how to do that. That should be the work of this subcommittee and that's what we're trying to accomplish. So we are, I would say, unless someone says differently, all four of us that have met, 
we'd like to continue this deep dive. I have also, I will say, offered several documents. One was a document from uh, about the arts in Western Mass. I have offered articles. We have yet to put those on the agenda to have a conversation. So I feel that we are making offers, but that the offers are falling on blind ears. So we don't, I don't know if we need to, if folks want to have a conversation about this, fine, but I don't think it's anything that folks need to feel, make an excuse for. I think we need to open the door and move it forward. And that's what I have to say. That would be my report. And Jesse, Talani, or Dana, please add to that or subtract from it. I'm going to mute myself if my hand stops shaking. Thanks, Kent, for, um, for saying all that. Um, I, I stand behind everything that you, uh, that you just voiced. Um, and uh, I don't think I have anything else to add at this moment. I third that and thank you, Kent. Well said, I think that summed it up pretty well. Uh, Hey everyone, yeah, I'm, I'm in, an, I'm concurring as well. Uh, I did look at the, the past. Oh, not the thing here. Uh, I did review the last couple of uh, offers of people who, who do these trainings, and I mean, I'm not as intrigued. You know, like I do, I do agree with Kent. I would love to have somebody who, who you know, who, who's been doing this work longer than the pandemic, longer than the death of George Floyd, longer than the, you know, all of those things, because I think it's important that there has been work of who have been doing this more than the reckoning that we are seeing today. And as we move forward, I want to put value into those voices who may have been not, you know, who have the experience, who worked with numerous groups, not someone who I, I mean, I think it would be great to have someone who got some sort of art perspective in there. That would be great. But the art perspective is less important when it comes to equity in a matter of just understanding the community and the group of people that it needs to work with. Thanks, Jelani. That's uh... I don't know if you can see any of us or if you're just on your phone, but Kent was giving you snaps and, and I, I clapped for you on that. Great, thanks. I can't see anyone, but I'm, I'm glad to be acknowledged. So that's our report. Thank you. You're um, welcome. I, I think that the committee, and I'm sorry if I have poor internet, I think that the committee is very happy to take your lead, or I am very happy to take your lead. So whatever trainers y'all recommend, I think it's fine to move forward with. I got an offer from someone that we've partnered with in the past, so I just pass on that information. And if the, if the recommendation is not to move forward, then that's totally fine. And I can let that person know that the equity committee needs more time to evaluate and make a decision moving forward. And, and that's fine. I'm happy to make that convey that. Um, I'm also happy if you'd like to just have conversation and learn more about their, Jesse, you mentioned wanting to learn more about this, this person's practice, happy to connect you if you want to learn more about their practice. And if not, then that's totally fine as well. Um, in terms of discussion, can, I thought that we, we, had kind of agreed by email to have conversation about um, some of the articles you shared. I know many of us read them. If this meeting is not, this meeting may not be the moment to do it, it but we should set at this meeting that at our next meeting, we are gonna spend time discussing those articles if that's part of the proposal. Like, I think we can say that here and now, if next meeting is the right time to do it, I'll, like I'll let you decide and 
All right. Well, thank, thank you for that, Danielle. What we like to do is rather than to stick it all in one meeting, this is not a one shot deal like a baptism. You know, we don't just get to get dunked and then everybody's purified. What we like to do is to ask, I mean, some meetings are really chock full, like right now we have chock, but that each meeting or every couple meetings, we take time to deal with these conversations. So that is something that is built into the structure of what we're doing, right? Rather, so it's baked in rather than, okay, here's a one shot deal. We're doing a pancake dinner and we're serving Aunt Jemima pancake stuff. So everything's groovy now, right? No, we're not doing that. What we're saying is we wanna bake this in we want to have a conversation, then that way we'll know how to proceed with the next step. Cool? Yeah. So so Brian usually sets the agenda one, at least one week prior. Brian, what is your timeline that you have to post the agenda by? And like, I would say maybe can equity committee just email me and Brian or even just Brian and say, this is the assignment or like, this is the topic of conversation. And Brian and I will make sure that the whole committee gets access to whatever articles we need and send reminder emails ahead of the meeting saying, we're going to have this discussion. It's going to be, y'all decide, is it going to be a half hour conversation? Is it going to be an hour conversation? Do we need it the full meeting? Right. And, and Brian, when, how, how far in advance do you have to, you have to post it online, right? It's 48 hours business days, like business hours. So I usually have mm -hmm. to post the agenda um, the Thursday or Friday before the meeting on Tuesday. Okay, that's easy. Thank you. And if you want to, you know, pick one of the articles, and we can spend um, however long long we need to judge to to go over and digest that one article, and we can have everybody um, have it fresh in their minds to to read it. I would love to take time okay. during one of our member our council meetings to to do that. Cool. Um, all right, excellent. Great. Uh, bueno. Thank you, Equity Committee. Looking forward to more. Should we should we take a beat and transition towards biennial since we have our guests? Great. Um, Hello. Hi, Jason. Hi. Hi. Hi, um, also joining me is um, Amelia Forhawks, I believe is here. And Ella, are you here? Ella, I believe so. Um, yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, hi. So uh, we thank you for taking the opportunity to speak with us about the biennial. Um, I know I've reached out to a couple people uh, from the Northampton Arts Council Previous, uh, prior to actually appearing at this meeting. And I did speak with the um, members of the equity committee regarding what we see as, as, as some deeply problematic um, patterns of behavior along with work and, and really some deeply problematic um, things happening with the biennial in regards to equity and diversity, but in particular representation of indigenous and native peoples. Um, you know, this began, and I, and for those of you who are on the call who are not aware, um, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and just run through the, the series of events. Um, this began with, at the uh, reception for the In It Together show um, that had happened um, at the, the library gallery, the, the um, I was a part of it. Uh, I believe uh, were you was anyone else a part of it that that is here for this particular call does ma doesn't matter. <laughs> um, we were having a reception for this event and we were going through looking at individual pieces and having you know the artists who had taken place um, speak to their work and we got to the point where Doris Madsen um, began to share on her work. Um, I should go I should tell you know this committee that I I know Doris um while I wouldn't consider Doris a close friend we are definitely colleagues in in the East Hampton arts world we've done a variety of work together um and collaborated on projects um I considered Doris to to have her heart in the right place but unfortunately um her heart being in the right place isn't enough in this particular instance um she began to to speak about a piece that she had shown showing in the the in it together show that she identified as being 
also in the the Northampton Biennial, and it became very, very, very quickly. It became deeply, deeply troubling to to not only see the work and how this particular art, artist, who is an older white woman, was choosing to represent Native people, Native genocide, and and in in particular with a callousness and a coldness and kind of a, a complete misunderstanding of our culture, our history, our identities um, in a way that was, that, that was, is, is just unacceptable. Um, at that point, I began to reach out to other native artists in the community, indigenous artists in the community to find out, uh, I myself having been rejected from the biennial, to find out who else had been rejected as, as an indigenous artist. And, it, Along with finding the number of, of those artists whose work had been rejected, um, what became even more disturbing was to find out how many native and indigenous artists in this region just did not know that the biennial was a thing that was happening. It, it appeared that zero outreach had been done to, to our communities. Um, and you know, as I began to speak with the Latinx communities, it became very, very apparent that no outreach had been done there either. Um, I then reached out to the Northampton Arts Council and spoke um, with one of the council members on, on Brian's uh, direction. And that conversation was deeply troubling. Just deep, it, it began from the point where I was told point blank, oh, we're not going to sh tell Doris that she can't show work. Um, it, it, it came from this place of, of patent white supremacy uh, and really a, a defensiveness that is just unacceptable, like plain and simple unacceptable. Um, and when, when in reality, the individual I was speaking to later in that call made it very clear that they didn't even have the, the authority or the ability to make any decisions regarding this show on their own, but, but they position themselves first from a position of, you need to go away because we're not going to have this conversation. Um, I, I invited others here to speak um, and I'd love to be able to just turn this over to them so they can share this, their experience. But I am, I am here right now from my own point of view as an indigenous artist who, who's very active in our community calling for, the, for, for this committee to, to, to stop any, any further action on the biennial. This needs to stop. You don't, you, this does not need to move forward. At this point, you should cancel this event and go back to the drawing board because you have neglected entire populations and you are letting white people speak about the native experience. And that is patently unacceptable. And for that, uh, then from there, I'd, I'd like to turn this over to the other individuals who are joining us. Nakamak, Jason. Um, Atili, hi. Elavunga. Um, I'm a Labrador Inuk artist, poet, writer, um, resident of Northampton. It's nice to come talk with you today. Um, so I submitted work, poetry and um, artwork that was rejected and it was, it stung, I'll tell you that. And it's not because I, I think I'm marvelous and wonderful, but I wanna be included as a resident of this town for years now. Um, I met Brian before and I've been to um, NAC events, whatever. So I don't know, my artwork has sold in a Toronto gallery. My work has been published in a Nuttut magazine of ITK, Inuit Tapiri Kanatami, um, a national Inuit organization of Canada. I'm a dual citizen. And I work really hard as an Enoch woman to show the world Inuit are here, indigenous are here, natives are here. And I work um, as an online teacher for NACOB, North American Indian Center of Boston. Um, and so I just had a class today and we're reading the Angeline Boulay book, The Firekeeper's Daughter, and we have a core group and and so I'm very active in the community and my family lives in Canada. And so I just drove to them when the border finally opened. So I'm not 
that wonderful, but I actually have a voice that's worth being heard by other people. I was um, the social marketer for Straw Dogs Writers Guild for, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. I was on the steering committee also. And I stepped down just because I was losing my creativity time, giving it all away. So I keep it and now I'm producing my own work. So it's taken a long time because I grew up in the North Shore and a white family and my mother's a residential boarding school survivor, so she lost me. And so I've always had white people tell me how my culture is and who I am. And so now as an adult, I've claimed my voice and I've met my birth family and, and I'm very active, as I've said, a beneficiary of Nunociaba Kavamenga. And so I'm learning my language and I don't mean to be shouting, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I've worked really hard. And so I want other people to know that Inuit are here. You know, we're not Eskimos, we're Inuit. And there's that whole, you know, Nanook of the North stereotype that I get to combat every day when I walk out my door in Hathaway Farms. You know, I wear the Labrador face, Labrador flag face mask and I'm here. And then this past summer, I went to a outside restaurant and this guy attacked me across from the, verbally attacked me, you're dirty, you're, and he said these vile things. And, um, and it still stings when I drive by that outdoor restaurant. And so this is the racism that I encounter. Um, and our kid is, um, I don't know, I was a single mother and have a kid and she's half black and claims herself as they, them and, you know, and they moved out to Boston. So they're not the only brown person out here. I encourage them to move to Boston, to blend in, then be in white Western mass. But my life is here with my husband and like, I don't know. So I'm saying all this and I'll like criticize myself later. And I said too much, and but I still believe that I need to speak up. And I am, I am Ella Nathaniel Alkevich. My, my mother is Juliana Millicent Regina Nathaniel. You know, she's a residential boarding school survivor. And so I see Jason's background and it hits me, you know, and I make these beaded pins, orange shirt beaded pins, you know, and there's an event in Boston on Thursday that I'm going to. And, and it's like, people need to know what indigenous have gone through, you know, like, it's popular now in Canada to talk about the residential boarding schools and, you know, they've unearthed human remains because the children were taken away in boarding schools and then they were abused and they were killed and buried and ignored and they never came home. And so like, that's what the flags are behind Jason, representing a body each that's been found. And Canada actually copied the United States. So if you look up the Carlisle School and Captain Richard Pratt, and, and he did it just so we could stay in the army. And he had this wonderful idea. And so it's all this history that's coming out that's finally being unearthed and told. Pardon the pun. Like it's, it's finally being told. And, and it's, I need to express it. And I'm a writer and I, I teach and I sign and I create and I talk and, and I cry the whole time because my mother at 71 is depressed and she's malnourished and, and I saw her and I couldn't pack her in our bag and just bring her home like, and so I speak for her because she didn't get to speak. So I would like people to hear other indigenous in the room. And Amalia is having, 
she messaged me, she's having technical problems. And like, I'll go to her house and with a mask on and help her figure out Zoom. And that's what you do for elders. And, and I think I said enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I did Thank actually you. come down to the gallery this gallery space uh, that we're in, that we're we're we are doing our um, residential school memorial piece. Uh, it opens on the thirtieth for you know Orange Shirt Day um, to show the difference between what 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 your process has allowed to come forward and represent as 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 native experience versus the actuality of native experience the piece that we're just, that we're talking about frames frames the indigenous and call of the indigenous colonization as being a point in time that 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 centered in the well that centered around Massachusetts Bay, the Mayflower, the Prince Philip's Rebellion. You know, this was 1993. It was 1993 before the last residential school in Canada closed. The United States still has over two dozen boarding schools open. You know, the idea that, that you would disregard indigenous voices and native voices, especially now in favor of of old white women who want to discuss this because suddenly it's become something they've had to learn about is it's 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 reprehensible. And the fact that that this this committee is hiding behind well this is our process. This individual I spoke with at, at NACA was like, well our process is blind. Well when you blind a process you don't see us. You don't see this. When you choose not to see color, you choose not to see us. Your system is fundamentally flawed and it has resulted in, in kind of the worst case scenario because the piece that, I, that I'm referring to with, with, from Doris is a piece of, of genocide art from a white artist. And it's a piece of genocide art that, that neglects the next 400 years of genocide that happened on top of that in favor of a, of a, of a, of a narrative that, that's a myth that lacks reality and you'll defend it and you'll ignore that, that this worst case scenario is indicative of a, of a much larger and broader problem that your system, the way you've chosen to design this, the people you selected to, to make these decisions don't represent this community. They don't represent this community of artists. They don't represent this, this community of people. They definitely don't represent the worldwide majority of brown and black people. So I don't know what to say. I, I honestly, I do not know what to say to this committee right now, other than it is time for you to do the right thing. It is time for you to do the just thing. And it's time for you to say, we made a mistake. We have not planned this out. We didn't run this by our equity, equity committee, which, which I was very, very disturbed to find out the individual who I spoke to from NACA told me that all of this was run through your equity committee and it wasn't. Your selections for the, for the selection committee weren't run through your equity committee. The process wasn't run through your equity committee. So I'd like to hear from you. Um, I think I need to respond. Um, it was, Jason, a very upsetting conversation. I, I agree. Um, I don't think I ever, the, um, just to make a, the jury makes the decisions. The equity committee does not make the decisions. And I, I don't believe I said that. No, what you said was that the jury members 
had been had been approved by the equity committee, had oh, been vetted right. by the equity committee, and the process that the jury used had been vetted by the equity committee. Your the equity committee told me otherwise. Right, the jury members are brought to the board um, when we when we make a decision about the about the jury members. Um, you know, it's funny. I always was um, kind of proud of that we that we had submissions that were blind. And um, I mean, hearing you speak about it is, it's, oh, it's, it's making me feel like we, should, we do need to, you know, rethink. But yes, I, I mean, I always we wanted, can... I, we always were concerned that the art should speak for itself and that's what the jury should focus on. But that is so that's... deeply problematic when you select artists a, A, when you select jurors who are who represent the white art industrial complex, and you know, I have I have come to learn who your jurors were, and one of them is a graduate, an MFA graduate from Yale. The other is a is a white individual who run, runs a gallery that primarily shows white art. You will get white art if if your selectors love clam chowder. It doesn't matter if there are other delicious things on the menu. They're going to select clam chowder. <laughs> like I know that's not a great metaphor. I had I, yes, exactly. When you don't take the time to actually learn about the artist, you end up with a with a with a pool of white people. When, when you select white people, when you choose white people, when you have them making the decisions, you end up with white people. Well, our jury were not just white people, but, um, but okay, I can let, see how, let's stop pretending how we all don't know the, who the jury is. The, the, I can see how important. It's one, it's one Asian is. woman with, a, with, with an MFA from, from Yale and a white man. And a Latina woman. Who? Alvilda. Um, what's her last name? I'm sorry. I'm okay. Yeah, I know Avilda. Right. I, I was Avilda. not aware that Avilda was on the panel. Right, I, she was on the panel. Yeah. And they were all present. I, I wasn't part of it. Um, so I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt both of you in this conversation. Um, Brian, would you mind actually sharing the meeting norms? I'm realizing we, we didn't start off the meeting by looking at our norms. And this is a hard conversation for a lot of folks. And I think it's just important that we ground it in our meeting norms. These are norms that the board has voted on and discussed. And I'm, I apologize, I should have opened the meeting by bringing them and we have we have guests in the room as well. Um, and I'd love to just share the link to our meeting norms so that we can have um, some guidelines for how we're going about the conversation. Yeah. I think um, I, I don't folks have anything. I Okay, and my, my understanding was that we were just here to, to engage in public speak, um, that this wasn't going to be a question and answer from, from the committee. I am glad to do that, but that was my understanding. Well, so Jason, I heard you asked for a response from the board, and I just want to yeah. encourage all of us to use okay. I statements. And I, like I've heard a lot of great I statements tonight, but I want to encourage all of us to use I statements. So if you want to take a look at the um the norms doc we can take take a look at that um assume good intentions and part of that is recognizing our own privileges and biases um we want to remember that we're going to be calling in and not out in this meeting um we want to point out problems in ways that empower us to find solutions this is what we're here to do is find solutions and also take responsibility um recognize intention versus impact Something you say may not intend to do harm, but if it does, you, we have to all be sure to own that. And linked here is a, a document from Kent, um, which is about how to apologize. So if you haven't taken a look at that recently, I'd encourage you to refresh. We wanna lean into discomfort, hurt and discomfort are opportunities for growth, especially when we're talking about e equity work. Um, we wanna be respectful of folks' pronouns and gender identities. We didn't do intros around that, but <laughs> if you feel comfortable changing your name to include pronouns, like we wanna be mindful of that. Again, stories stay, lessons leave. Um, we want to remain open to feedback. So if you do get called in, we want to say thank you. So Jason, Ella, thank you thank for you. being here. Thank you for calling us in. Thank you for giving us this feedback. This is important. That hasn't been said yet. Like, thank you. Um, we want to be mindful of airtime. So if you've spoken a lot, we want to create space for, for others. Um, and we want to set clear boundaries and consequences as a team because we're in charge of our own culture of accountability here. So. Let's keep that in mind. I, I want to start by saying thank you, Jason and Ella, again for calling us in. 
I think this is an important conversation that we're all having. Jesse, I see your hand raised. Do you want to jump in? Um, I want to, I do. Um, I don't want to cut anybody else off though. So um, Ellen, if you, if you want to finish your, um, your thoughts, I, you know, I defer to you, um, but I, I, I do want to um, kind of cut through the feelings and get to the bottom of the actual question at hand. Um, but I, I will, you know, defer to you to, to finish, to finish your no, thought. No, please go ahead. Okay. go ahead. This is really awkward for me. So I'm happy to move along. Okay. Um, it, beyond, uh, beyond, uh, who said what, um, really the question at hand right now that it sounds like is a uh, recognition that um, we as an arts committee have done wrong and how we can make things right. Um, Jason has asked us to consider canceling the um, biennial and going back to the drawing board to be able to reach out to artists in and focusing on how we can do that to areas that we have yet to be able to communicate with. Um, I, for one, would like to support that. Um, I don't know if can you put that forward in a proposal then, you know? I, yeah, no, I'm, what, what I was gonna say is, I don't know if people wanna have a discussion, but I would like to uh, put forward a motion that um, we can vote on to postpone the um, biennial and, uh, ask for resubmissions and work with um, the people who uh, are kindly here, if they would like to be uh, participatory in outreach and help us get a better understanding of where some of our faults lie in outreach um, and going beyond that to uh, other forms of outreach that we need to really figure out on our own because what we have right now is not good enough. Thanks for that, Jesse. I think if we go forward with this, which I um, am in support of, that we we either hire outside consultants to administrate the the call or hire a curator who is also has more experience at administrating calls of such magnitude. I also have a question as to whether a biennial highlighting local work like is that even the move like is that even the way we want to spend our time and resources two years ago after the last biennial I strongly advocated for not having a biennial I think that the, the practice of having an every two year highlight of local art is going to automatically be a almost promulgate the echo chamber that is the Northampton arts scene so I've advocated for us to think about what other kinds of displays we can promote, what other kinds of uplifting of art we can have. So sort of adding to the conversation with Jesse is like, if we're gonna rethink what this two weeks from now program is supposed to look like, I'd like that to, I'd like us to take a look structurally at whether an exhibition in a, in a library is the right thing the, the right method, the right mode of presentation for what the goals of the event are. And the goals are to highlight local art, right? Or I don't know, we need to define the goals. I'd like just to redefine what the goals are because I think it was set up maybe a long time ago and had really wonderful intentions of highlighting local artists and bringing the community together. And I wonder if I can't articulate those goals off the top of my tongue, then maybe they're outdated. So I'd like to bring that to the conversation as well. 
Um, and I know Amalia was not on the call earlier. Jason, do you want to say that? And I also want to give Amalia- Yes, I, I am so sorry. My my 14 year old is calling me. I have to jump off and see what he what's going on with him. Um, I apologize deeply. It, he just, he wouldn't be calling if it wasn't a thing. So I apologize. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. And Amalia, we're glad to have you back. I know it says your audio is connecting, but feel free to jump in if you have anything you'd like to share. And we'll come back to you later too, once you're fully connected. We can't hear you. Amalia, we can't hear you. She doesn't say that she's muted. Unmuted, muted. It looks like your mic is now muted, Amalia. If you do, if you do want to weigh in and chat, we're kind of discussing what the next steps might look like for this upcoming biennial and then for any kind of future restructuring of that. If you have thoughts, if you want to share more about your experiences, we're really happy to listen. Just feel free to unmute and chime in. Um, in the meantime, Brian, your hands up. Did you want to speak? No, I already said what I wanted to say. Yeah, I'd be curious to see, to vote on Jesse's uh, and the proposal from um, Jason and Jesse to see where that goes, because if not, I have a second one that I can propose as well. So I think we, as order of business, we need to first see how supportive people are for Jesse's proposal to support what Jason is asking for which is to scrap this one and to rethink the structure. Um, I also will add, I don't think one person can curate it, he, she, they. Uh, typically what you really need are several people from different communities so that each community feels that it has a voice. You know, it would be like asking a guy to curate a bunch of work that includes women's work and it's like, I don't think anybody has that one, any single person has an expertise, but can we vote on that first and then move that forward and then conversation? I think that's the way we should rock, right? Or am I wrong? I'd actually like to have a, a conversation. I mean, I, I'm fine if we put this forward for a vote, but before we vote, I, I'd like to have a conversation just for clarification and elaboration and maybe revision. Uh, Freeman, since you've brought that up, do you want to continue with any questions or thoughts that you might have around that? Yeah, I mean, is that this process okay, Danielle? I mean, is that what, what I suggested? Okay, we have a conversation first and because- Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think it would be good to hear what the implications are, like what happens if we <clears throat> cancel, like what, what is the process for canceling, who, who, what are the what are the five steps down the line consequences of that decision um or canceling or postponing right because it initially it was like a postpone until we do it right and then it was a cancel altogether so i think we need clarity on on that and what it looks like who is is implicated all, all of that should be up for consideration and conversation did so, you have other questions freeman well i have a lot of thoughts um uh, first of all, you know, deep appreciation for Jason and Ella and Amalia for, for being here to come forward and to make their statement and, and to help us. Um, you know, I, I had been, I had drafted a statement or, or an email that I was planning to send to folks. And I, I, I felt a little bit uneasy sending it because I really wanted to have a conversation about it. And it fits in with this conversation that we're having now about, about our process. So if you just indulge me for, for a few minutes, I, I just wanna 
kind of connect that statement to this. And, and Danielle, if I go too long, please interrupt me and let me know. Um, you know, every, I, I try to read the, the um, columns and the editorials, letters to the editor and the Gazette, and they're not, you know, fully representative of an entire community, but, but one of the, one of the columns that I really appreciate reading is Tolly Jones column monthly. And the last column that she wrote really spoke to me, you know, because she was talking about how exhausting doing the work of, of you know, that white people need to do to, to dismantle this systemic inequality. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm aware of that. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I, I can't worry about the people who don't acknowledge that white supremacy is a serious problem and needs to be addressed uh, immediately and, and actively. Um, but I do wonder about those of us who already know that it's a problem and, and what we can really do about it and, and what's the best way to go about doing it. You know, so, you know, so for example, you know, when I disagree with Jesse and some of his um, proposals for actions, it's not because I disagree fundamentally with, with many of the places that he wants to get to. Um, so so in, in thinking about this particular issue, I'm wondering if um, rather than canceling it, I'm wondering if um, ha having it as an example of what our process has been um, at some appropriate time, but with a response from the artists, you know, who feel that the, the process was um, discriminatory, racist, you know, white supremacist, what, what, however you want to, to phrase it, um, because I get it, I, I see it. And I think in some ways, revealing our own flaws is a part of that educational process and, and giving folks who want to respond to that the opportunity to do so. And then to, to make some statement following that, I think that, that feels to me like a more positive statement and an acknowledgement that we, we already kind of went down a road. Um, and, and it would be good to kind of, it's like being transparent about our process. We've, we've, been a, we've, we've done something that was offensive. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. I mean, I guess that's, you know, I hope that makes sense, I, you know. Ken, did you wanna elaborate on, on your suggestion since it's related? Well, my suggestion is related only in the sense that I fully support uh, Jason's uh, comments 100%. I do think that it is extremely flawed for all the reasons I won't go into that. But what I'm wondering is that if the council chooses to not scrap this one, what my suggestion is, is that we yank that piece out of, of Doris Madsen's piece and instead replace it with a comment that in some ways aligns with what Freeman said, but something to the extent is, is that this piece has been pulled by NAC due to its offensive and inaccurate portrayal of indigenous people. NAC is working to be more accountable in the future with its art programs so that we own our mistake, we yank that, and we also, there's a visible sign that this is not the way it's supposed to roll. If there's no other accounting with the other pieces, then we might continue on. I'm just trying to find a medium in the middle in case folks don't want to support canceling it at this point, that there is a way to own the mistake, which I do think that's pu being publicly accountable, which I totally support and think it's important. And, um, you know, that's just my suggestion. I'll be short winded for once. Jesse? Um, thank you, Freeman. Thank you, Kent. Um, I 
like the idea of some sort of public forum in which to have a discussion, in which to have a um, elaboration on the process that uh, we are trying to rectify. Um, I still think that that can happen um, perhaps even more powerfully if it's around a completely new presentation, if it's not wedded to something that already has problems to it, but rather, and this is picking up off of what Danielle was saying in terms of questioning the biennial in general, and instead perhaps focusing on something that is a little bit more inclusive and is less, um, attached to historic white supremacy and historic European uh, art canon um, and have that discussion around a new presentation of art that is more pluralistic um, and include the artists that are uh, indigenous, that are black, brown, um, whoever is included in that um, exhibition uh, to be able to have that public discussion, public forum in that space, rather than have it wedded to um, the biennial as it currently stands, even if it does, uh, even if we do end up removing just one piece. I'm in support of that, except for the fact that if you're going to ask BIPOC individuals to to put their late not only to commit to the labor of a public forum of listening to white tears that you're going to also have to pay folks because these people are asked over and over and over again to exhaustion to support why they're part of our community. I know as a black artist myself, I mean, this is just like, and so when you're in a community such as Northampton, then you're going to listen to a lot of pushback and unless, and so this process then needs to be thought out quite well. Otherwise, what all, all you get is a bunch of white tears and, you know, I myself and I imagine Jason and Ella and Amelia, Amalia have had enough of those tears already. I agree. And I would definitely second the need for it to be um, paid. So my concern about canceling is that I do hear Freeman's point that it is a really good opportunity to be transparent about the process. And also, I think that it needs to be completely scrapped and we need to define what are the, the goals and learning outcomes and objectives of a presentation of community art and figure out the right way to do it. I, and I don't think it's a biennial. Like I really don't think it's a biennial. Um, so I sort of see merit to finding a way to create space within this program that has been planned to one, say that a work of art, I don't know that we need to publicly shame the artist. I think that there needs to be a call in conversation with the artist about why their work is not going to be publicly displayed. But I think that there could be a statement on the wall that says a work of art that is deemed genocide art was approved for this exhibition. This is our process that allowed that to happen. And it was due to the labor, the emotional labor, the physical labor, the showing up labor of local indigenous artists that that work is no longer on view. And here is work. I would love, I would love to find a way to actually include the works that originally were submitted by Jason, Ellen, and Amalia, and any other artists that have kind of raised concern about it and, and name, because we, we were operating under a blind submission process, these are some things we missed. These are some really important voices that we missed. And it's, it's causing us to completely overhaul our process and we don't know what that's gonna look like. Here's a suggestion box. Here are some post-it notes, tell us what you think. Um, we're gonna try to do something better next time. That would, that, and, and that's how I've seen it done in, which probably is problematic. The fact that I'm saying this, this is how I've seen it done a little bit in museums, um, except we've had the problematic work on view and are told to write in the wall label why it's problematic. 
So I'm not advocating for us to put the problematic work on view and say why it is, but I think mm -hmm. I'm really not at all. I do agree wholeheartedly that whether the show happens in its current iteration or not, that we do not display that work. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I know Jason has named that he's already had conversations with this artist, but I think it's mm -hmm. on us to also explain why. And I'm happy to have a have that conversation. If, if whoever wants to have the conversation should have it. And if people don't want to have that conversation, I'm happy to be someone in conversation with the artist around it. Um, but I'd love to hear others thoughts on the, the sort of two proposals um, and any questions. And especially if Amalia, if, if you want to weigh in on this or have anything else you want to share, I know you didn't get a chance to speak earlier. Just want to create more space if you want to um, share anything. One thing, oh, Amalia, go ahead. I see you unmuted. I'm, I'm sorry, I have never done a Zoom. I have no idea how this works. So <laughs> I came into the meeting late because I had a sick dog that I was dealing with. Um, and I've, I've heard you ask for my input. So I don't really know because I was late to the meeting, I don't have a full understanding of what's going on. I'm getting the gist of it. Um, and it, it, it sounds like there needs to be some inclusion. I don't see an event being canceled um, because there was a problem. I am always of the, the opinion that if something has to be removed to make it a better situation, then something can be added. Um, if you're choosing to remove a piece from the exhibition and you have the leeway time-wise to do a removal, then you have the leeway time-wise to do an addition and rectify any possible innocent mistakes by adding on. Um, but once again, as I said, I'm coming into this really late. Maybe this has already been discussed. So, but that's my two cents. Thank you for your two cents, Amalia. It's very valuable. Okay. Dana, did you wanna share? Um, thank you, Amalia and Ella for sharing and Jason earlier and everybody here. I was just going to go back to that Jason's initial ask was a full cancellation. And I do appreciate and would be on board with these more diplomatic sort of attempts to rectify, but because it does seem that there was, there's the issue of this art piece that's problematic, but it also seems that there are a lot of missteps in terms of the process and there is harm done throughout the whole experience. I think I just wanted to go back to what Jason brought forward, which was a full cancellation. And that to me feels like, you know, sometimes it's the simplest thing to do if you want to include people to just listen to what they have to say and do it and then, you know, figure out with their input and input from the communities that they're helping to represent what the, the best way is forward after that. But because this is happening in two or three days, um, I don't know, I think to me a cancellation makes sense that we just honor his request and not do it and then figure out what subsequent statements need to be made or um, new ways forward presented. But I do also understand the nuance here and I think all of these other suggestions are, are really valuable. I just wanted to bring that back to Jason a little bit. Brian, are there any um, 
consequent, like what are the consequences for canceling? Do we've, what kind of promo have we done already? And are there any artists, like I'm trying to think of, I'm not worried about artists that are the same artists that we've shown over and over again, but we, do we have any like first time submissions? Do we have folks that are, that this is gonna have a negative impact on? I don't cancel? have, I, I'm not as uh, integrally involved in this uh, as the, the biennial okay. subcommittee. Okay. Um, we have, I just printed postcards and posters today. Um, there is a virtual online poetry event planned. Um, there is no in-person opening planned. Uh, and Ellen has, and the subcommittee has been planning uh, the, the art delivery. Um, so. And the ask was to cancel the, the exhibition as well as the poetry program? Or is it just the exhibition? Uh, I thought the ask was just the exhibition. But I'm, I would like to go back and double check that. I wonder if Jason knows that there is a poetry piece to this or, you know, remembers or whatever. I'm, I'm open to, to do whatever the, the council wants to do. Um, so. I guess the question around the poetry is, um, was that chosen at the same time by the same jury? Um, is it all part and parcel or was there a separate um, approach just for the spoken word? Ellen, as far as you know, the poetry was totally separate, yes? Yes, yes. Yes, that's, that it's was my understanding. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's got a pretty good array of folks, including our, our young poet laureate. So that might still go on since it's virtual as well. Was the, was the, were the poetry submissions? So I remember when, when the youth poetry submissions were considered, Kent, you overhauled that process of, of doing outreach for the youth poet laureate. Mm -hmm. That process was not the same process for the poetry. That's exactly right. Okay. And Brian put in the chat who the poetry jurors were, which was pretty, you know, we have Susan Kahn, uh, Enzio, who is a Haitian born poet, and Karen uh, Schofield, who was our poet laureate. So, you know, a decent selection of folks and the poems, the poets themselves seem to be across the board. But it's a different process. Okay. Thank you for being here, Ella. Yes, thank we you, really, Ella. We appreciate you. Really yes, thank you. Um, to to that end, in terms of the poetry, I think then that would be that would be separate and um, should continue onward. But my, so my understanding, so Ella was here talking about, I'm, and I'm so sorry that she just jumped off about the, the fact her poetry submission was rejected, right? So I'm, my, my question then is about the outreach on the poetry side, because I think we pretty much ensured that there was strong outreach on the Youth Poet Laureate, um, even though the makeup of art, but if the problem is outreach for both visual arts and poetry, we still have a an outreach problem on poetry, and I'm I'm fine with keeping poetry on because mm -hmm. because of the composition of the judges. However, we want to make the the rationale, but I just want to be clear on what the I just want to make sure I'm fully understanding the problem. Um, well, I you know part of the problem is the outreach as, as you. Uh, said it, Danielle, and a lot of the, the, the outreach was done via social media. So I know I posted on mine, but if you're not friends with someone on social media and you don't follow the NAC website, then how does that outreach go out? So it would be important to look back on different folks in various communities that would be uh, outreach connected so that you go, okay, you know, people that are not on Facebook, how else do you do outreach? And that's that's a conversation 
to have. There's lots of folks not on social media who are refusing it or are only on one thing. I mean, I, I posted on the 413 Stay Awake uh, website. However, if you're not part of that and you're not one of the thousand people that I'm connected to, then, um, you know, or you send it to one person and he, she, they don't get to post it so that that person doesn't move that stuff forward. So a lot of this is is how we connect with we, I mean, Mina can speak to, 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 to those dilemmas and stuff like that. So I think it's a way of putting all our heads together going, what's missing and how do we do better? I, of course, would be much more, I mean, would really want to do something, um, perhaps to acknowledge the, you know, the situation that we're in. I would not want to see the event canceled. Of course, we put so much time into it. Um, I would not want to tell the artists involved that we're not going to have it. They're not going to get to hang their pieces. Um, I would not like to tell the library that they're going to have an empty gallery this month. Um, th those are just the practical parts of this. But, you know, Danielle, you're often really thoughtful about how to deal with uncomfortable situations. And um, I'm, I am not great at, you know, just speaking and letting people know I don't know, I always feel like I put my foot in my mouth. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I would really not want to cancel the event. I mean, you probably already know that already. We're gathering the artwork on tomorrow and Thursday. We're hanging on Friday. So. I So Ellen, I wonder, do, do you think that, so you're the, the lead organizer of the show can can you imagine a way to create accountability, take ownership, um, be transparent <clears throat> about everything that has been aired here tonight within the context of the show? Like, is that something that is so? So I'm saying, oh, maybe we actually and Freeman was like, maybe we can use this as a, a learning opportunity. And Kent said as a secondary option, maybe there's this. Is that even feasible <laughs> by <laughs> the time that this thing opens on Saturday? Is it feasible? Yeah, I don't know. Is which part feasible, Danielle? The like notifying the artist who, who submitted the problematic work that that work is no longer going to be in the show and having a conversation about why, or at least having an email conversation about why, uh, creating, wall, creating wall text that names, like to draft wall text, to draft interpretive text about everything that has happened in this conversation is going to be a really heavy lift that everyone would have to weigh in on and to be transparent about all the ways in which we went wrong is going to be a writing process, right? Um, I imagine we'd also want to get the artists who raised concern with us. We'd want to share that public statement with them before it goes up on a wall as part of the show. So if I'm thinking about a timeline, ooh, <laughs> like, well, yeah. And I mean, in my proposal, if you do not cancel it, and I'm not saying I'm not for that. I'm just trying, just in case we have a backup. I think a simple paragraph, as I said, and we can knock that in. I, I can, you know, craft the initial one that people can sign. But I do think it's some that we pull it due to its offensive and inaccurate portrayal of indigenous people and that we're working to be more accountable in the future. I mean, that's we don't need to do the deep dive right there and there for future information. Contact NAC or something like that, you know, leave it open for folks to have the contact, but that just to basically say the truth and be done with it rather than a long explanation, which we, you know, no one's gonna have the time for that. 
So is it enough even to in the secondary proposal to evaluate to to just state why that one piece is not in the because I don't we don't need to say why the piece is not in the show because the piece has not been publicized. I think we just need to communicate to the artist that the piece is not going to be in the show and why and then publicly I think it is important within the context of the show to name that there have been concerns raised about the process we're accepting responsibility for that we're apologizing for that and we're going to overhaul future processes and like be in touch with us does that i would sense? leave that up to the committee i myself always like the name the harm done myself rather than sidestepping it but that's a committee vote but that's where i stand i say i mean we don't out her we don't say doris's piece but we say by the way this and this is what led us into this series yes. of processing right yes we're we're on the i think we're on the same page and using different words i yeah i agree that but that i think is going to be tricky is writing the writing that out is actually it's going to be no okay well then i'm glad you're doing our first draft Ken, as an option yeah you know i I, an option. I this is this is feeling to me like i'm going to be putting my foot in my mouth but cannot an artist express themselves in the way that they want to is all right, for example, Ellen, let me yes. let me just stop. Yeah, I need if to be I as an artist here. I decide to show a piece of art putting women into a grinder and coming out as meat. How would would you accept that? I think the jurors would not have accepted that. All right. But I'm also thinking about, you know, art in museums that is museums I mean, are made me, like totally reprehensible. But exactly. Yet, and what you seeing are museums going through an overhaul of the fact that a great deal of that art is stolen, a great deal of that art is misinterpreted, and it, it does not involve the stories of how that art came to be. We are at a transition. It used to be an artist can say what he, she, they wants to say, but the reality is these are people's story. Art is connected to people's cultures and experiences. A white artist, cannot ghost indigenous people and think that he, she, in this case, she can, can, can just ignore the fact that these people still exist, that indigenous people are still here, that they're not ghosts. They're an active part of our community and are moving forward. These are harms done. Just like if a white person wants to say that black people are nothing but folks that are lynched and stuff, I would have a gut ache behind that. I go, I, I, I so, no, I don't, I don't think an artist can't, I think you can make what you make, anything you want, that's your prerogative. But when you're showing it in public art, then public art needs to have parameters and boundaries. And that's one of the things we're beginning to look at. If we say we are uplifting BIPOC artists, as well as other marginalized communities, then those communities need to feel safe as they're walking into these spaces. These are typically white spaces. And if, you know, if we don't feel safe, we're not gonna be part of the community and the missteps are gonna to continue to happen. That's just my opinion. All right, well, I'm very well said. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's helpful, Kent, for me. Um, I, so <clears throat> I have a couple of thoughts. Um, Nina actually also had her hand up. I saw. I don't know, Nina, if you want to. Feel free to go. Um, I don't want to. No, no, I'll defer, Nina. And yeah, I didn't see that. Great. Well, thing, I I really didn't want to interrupt or interfere within the council conversation. Um, but I did want. So I do have to leave in a minute. Um, and so I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, for allowing me to be in this space tonight. And also to thank Amalia, Ellen, and Jason for calling in um, the council and by extension, the Mass Cultural Council as well, right? Because we are one, we are within one system um, that unfortunately does tend to perpetuate harm. And I am really grateful um, and admire everyone here for really engaging with a lot of uncomfortable truths. And they're uncomfortable because 
that is the way white supremacy and the narrative of white supremacy has controlled so many aspects of people who have been under invested in, unacknowledged and marginalized. And so I think, you know, it's wonderful that you have an equity committee. I know when I joined the last Northampton Arts Council meeting, you were working on drafting um, the first equity statement. And it's really great to see the evolution and the continual sort of grappling with the complexities that come with trying to dismantle um, white supremacy. And I think, you know, Ellen, you mentioned how this is awkward and it has to be awkward. Um, and I'm really glad that you're staying present in the conversation and that you have members here who are, um, who are generously offering their response and also feedback around the questions that come up in these conversations. And um, something that I do wanna share with you is, um, I feel like I've been <laughs> talking about it for a while, but we finally at the agency have a race equity statement of our own that also reads as a plan. And so it was recently approved by our council, our Mass Cultural Council Board, which we also call the council. Um, and we will be sharing that with everyone. And I do think, you know, we at the Mass Cultural Council have a responsibility in helping to support this work um, through our cultural, our local cultural councils and any of our cultural constituents um, that are doing this work um, across the state. So I, I hope to share that with you soon. And let's see. Um, Kent, I know you're, you're a wealth of resources when it comes to cultural equity and anti-racism um, work, as well as your knowledge of other facilitators. One group that I did wanna put on your radar in case you're curious is the, um, it's called Arts Connect International. I don't know if you've heard of them, but um, it's actually um, a collaborative, Let me put this in the chat quickly. It's a collaborative of some awesome folks. Um, and one thing that they rolled out last summer actually was, I forget how they framed it exactly, but it was either equity or anti-racism curriculum for white folks in the cultural sector. And so if I'm able to find that again, I don't think they're offering it anymore, but if I'm able to find that, I'll definitely share that with the council. And also you might just um, want to take a look at their website because they also offer some consulting services as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it was wonderful to see everyone. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or feedback or thoughts. Um, and again, thank you for your dedication towards everything. Thank you, Mina. Uh, thank Stay you. healthy. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Bye. 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 Raymond, did you want to continue? Um, yes. Uh, you know, one of the phrases that uh, the, my colleague at Renaissance, the principal there, Steve Mahoney, used to say was, um, you know, let's not have the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and it doesn't, you know, I don't know that it perfectly applies to this situation, but I do, I do wonder. If, if the good that can be done by having the show with a statement, uh, like Kent is suggesting, I, I don't know what to do about the artist's work, a specific work that's in question. And, and I'm wondering even about asking her how she would feel about being identified as having this work that's being challenged. Um, uh, you know, if that may also be part of the process of transparency and, um, you know, because the Arts Council, you know, did make a judgment, or not the Arts Council, but this, the, the um, jurors made a, a, a decision about her work, 
um, and 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 we as a as a council itself, as has been pointed out, you know, repeatedly in in the last year, are very much in process and very much in need of an examination that I also really look forward to um, the work that the equity committee will will put forward. But we are in process, right? I mean, we we you know we're not we're not where we want to be. Um, and I, I just wonder if, yeah, I, I just wonder if, if in may, being, acknowledging that we did what we did and that it's challenged is a more powerful way, I don't know that it is, but it, a more powerful way of, of, you know, communicating that we are in the midst of change. We are in the process of change. We are committed to change. I, I hear that. And I think we can have that conversation. If we do have the show, I think we can do that without displaying the art. And I, I just want to affirm that it, for me, it's really key that we're not promulgating like artists can, to Ellen's point, artists can create anything they want. They truly can create any work they want, but we have a decision as to what we're going to give a platform. And we've already by design made a decision to not give BIPOC artists a platform by the design of how this all went down. We made that decision. So the very, <laughs> I see it as the very least we can do at this moment, if we are going to do the show. Um, and if we're not going to, I do think that if we are going to do the show, we need to create additional pathways for the artists who raised concern to show their work if they want it displayed and pay them for that. Um, then I do not think it is acceptable for us to show work that has been named as genocide art by indigenous artists. I think that's really essential. And I think it is fine. And I don't, I like, I was hesitant. I know Brian shared the file in the meeting. So that we could discuss it. I was really hesitant to show, to share that. Like I thought about sharing that link and I didn't even want to share it because like, I don't think we should be promoting that image. It does harm. Sonia Clark is an artist who um, teaches at Amherst. And one of her projects is to unravel thread by thread, the Confederate battle flag. That's one of her art projects. And I do promotion for a lot of projects with her. And she's adamant about not showing the whole Confederate battle flag because it's a sign of hate. It's a sign and, and to, to just display the image, even if it's a part of unraveling, she doesn't want that image displayed. And that those, her words, her voice has stuck with me for so long. Anytime we talk about sharing images that are harmful and problematic. And I think when at the very least we have people telling us that these images are harmful to them, we know that they can be more harmful to the wider public. We should not be disseminating them. So I think if we have the show, it's more than acceptable to say there was a work of art that was submitted that was approved for the show, that thanks to, thanks to intervention by indigenous artists, we have pulled from the show and here's information as to why. And if the artist wants to be, if the artist like wants to be named publicly in that, we can name her, that's fine. If she wants that, maybe, I think we should take cue from um, Jason and Ellen Amalia if, if they have thoughts on that. But I think it's more than enough to say that the work has been omitted from the show and why. Right. I also think, I mean, I agree everything that Danielle said. I also think by naming the artist that it then becomes about the artist rather than about the indigenous people themselves. And that that is trauma that is being reproduced. And so to say, okay, here's the artist, then I don't, you know, fine. Jason's had this conversation with her. It's not like she doesn't know and then he knows her and she knows him. So more than likely, it appears that she's not backing away from this stuff. So to continue to shine the light on her says, hi, we're doing <clears throat> reprehensible art and we're not going to pay attention to the folks that really need to be highlighted, which are the indigenous artists themselves. So I support that. And I, I, I don't think we need to name her. And I don't think that we need to ask her Anything else? Um, I want to acknowledge uh, somebody who just came on. Um, sorry if I mispronounce your name, Mr. Beatty. Um, would Would you like to say any words um, before? Um, the 
Thank you, thank you. Um, oh, hello, my name is Justin Beatty. I'm an indigenous artist who lives in uh, Hadley, Massachusetts. I've lived in the Valley for quite some time. I'm of Ojibwe and Saponi descent. Um, I've worked with uh, various artists in the areas. Amalia is my aunt. I've done in the process of working on some stuff with uh, Jason. Uh, Ella is a good family friend. Um, there's a few other Native folks in the area that I'm working on, uh, putting on an Indigenous art show uh, in the fall. Um, I appreciate that this conversation is taking place because a lot of times these conversations um, either don't take place or they don't include the people who are uh, being misrepresented or being hurt by the imagery. Um, and so, I, I do appreciate that folks are taking time out of this. Um, it's it's difficult as an indigenous artist, especially in West, Western Massachusetts, um, to to gain visibility. Most people don't think about the native folks in this area, whether historically or the folks who have moved here from other places. Um, you know, one of the things, I, I, a lot of the things I work on are designed to increase that visibility. And because there's a lack of visibility, it becomes easy to disregard our opinions on things. And so um, when it, something is brought to our attention, generally, you know, we come together as a community. We all know, most of us know each other. Most of us interact with each other on the regular. And so we will talk about these things at length um, before, you know, any of us really comes forth to speak not only as individuals, but as members of that community. It's very important to us that we, you know, go forth and represent what our community um, leaves in and understands and, and follow those ideas. And so when I heard about this and I saw some of the artwork, and then again, you know, I saw the pieces in the chat, um, you know, they, they immediately kind of affected me, especially when you're considering the amount of erasure that goes on. You know, um, people will throw native names on stuff and not know the history of it. People, you know, there's streets named after uh, native people or native words and people don't know the history of it and, and things like that. But when you have something like this that is also very similar to like native ledger style art, which often depicted instances of, um, problematic situations between Native folks and non-Native folks historically. And I look at that and that's exactly what it says to me. It's like, I'm showing how you guys were removed or wiped out or like you're not here anymore. And I, I can't speak to the artist's intention because I don't know the artists themselves. But my understanding is that they're aware of the fact that something that they made is problematic to a very specific group of people. And they have chosen to kind of be like, oh, you know, oh well. I do agree that artists can make whatever they want to. I'm an artist myself. I don't want to be constrained. If I feel something, I want to be able to make it. But I also have the responsibility of accepting what comes with doing it. And if I make something that's hurtful, whether it was my intention or not, I have to acknowledge that. And I have to go, wait a minute, you know, like I'm, I'm not trying to make art to hurt people. I'm maybe trying to make art to educate people or to connect with people or to inform them in some way, shape, form, or fashion, but I don't want to hurt anybody with what I'm making. Okay? Now, had she come to the Native community and said, hey, like I'm making this thing and it's representative of this or that, you know, how, how do you guys feel about that? Like, is it's okay? Can I display this? But that doesn't happen. And that's why I appreciate this this opportunity to talk because here we are, you know, Jason said, hey, this meeting is going on. They want to have people, the equity community wants to have people come and talk about it. And, and to know that like we would be heard is, is valuable in, in my opinion. But I do agree. I mean, I think if here's a piece that's problematic, um, especially to like an extremely marginalized community and for the sake of like, reconciliation and us collectively as human beings trying to you know lift each other up and be respectful of each other if you have something like that that's problematic and hurtful you really kind of have to go okay and as an artist if i did i'd be like okay i'm going to take the l on this one you know you, just like comedians they don't know until they say it whether or not it's funny and if somebody they make a joke and somebody goes yo that wasn't cool then they got to go oh you know okay it, it was coming from an honest place but i i it 
it didn't land right. So I gotta, I have to readdress it. I have to maybe pull that out of my routine and revisit it and, and you know, come back with something else. But if you have an artist and I, you know, who has every right to stand by their work, but, and you need to find some place that can also support that. And if the places that you're putting it, people are going, wait a minute, we're not sure about this. You, you kind of have to accept that. And if your work is controversial in whatever, you know, form or fashion, there's a responsibility of, of dealing with that on the back side of it, on however, you know, people look at it because it is entirely subjective. We all look at art and we get out of it what we get out of it. But if a group of people, so in, in this case, you know, other indigenous folks are looking at this and going, no. I mean, like I, I saw it and I had a visceral, uh, oh, for lack of a better term, nauseating, you know, uh, and with, sprinkled with a little bit of anger. I'm, a, I'm also a cultural educator. I know these histories of, of in different indigenous nations. You know, people think where is this kind of pan-Indian monolith? And there's over 576 different federally recognized nations in the United States, another 60 state recognized, and then numerous, you know, native communities that are just living where they always have that people don't know these things about it. So they can take these liberties with our identity and our imagery. And then when they get challenged on it, they feel comfortable that like they're allowed to. So, you know, um, I, I personally, I'm not for it. I don't, you know, if you guys do decide to omit it, I agree, like don't name the artist because what you do is you are giving them some publicity. Because right? people are gonna seek that out. People are gonna go, who, who was it? And what was it? Like, let's go find it. And you're inadvertently supporting it anyway. If, you know, if, person, the artist themselves decides to say, hey, I was the person that was omitted, and that's fun. That's on them, and they have to deal with those repercussions. But if, you know, as an organization, um, you know, you're trying to make things fair and equitable, I, I would avoid, you, you also don't want it to turn into a situation where people are doxing that person, like looking them up and harassing them for whatever reason. Om omission from the project is a good step you know, with an explanation. And if people want to do, find out more, they can do their own research. And that, that's really all I want to say. And thank you for allowing me to time to speak. Very well thank said. you, Mr. Bainey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you, um, may I ask a question? May I ask a, an opinion? Um, the conversation that is, the, the baseline conversation that we're kind of talking about right now is, whether or not to cancel the entire biennial or to move forward with it, with this one piece removed. Um, do you have a, as an artist, do you have a feeling on one way or the other um, of those two? Jason has, has made his statement that he would, he would prefer the biennial not to move forward completely. Um, but that's where we find ourselves in the debate at the moment. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I really don't know enough about it to really have a full opinion either way. Um, I'm not one for uh, countering erasure with erasure necessarily, right? I think that if you are looking at ways to make the biennial inclusive of indigenous people and telling their stories as well and saying like, you know, hey, like, you know, there were people here, this is the kind of lives they led, they're, they're still around, there's descendants and different uh, indigenous groups that move through this area and live here still. And they're part of the community and we need to recognize them and support them as well. That's one thing. If the biennial is just going to be about, oh, these pioneers came and they founded this town at a wide spot in the river. And isn't that great? We've been here for 200 years. You know, like that's that's just propaganda. And that's not informing in a healthy and equitable way. And mind you, this is just my personal opinion. And, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not fully privy to all of the history or how, what the things have, the biennial has been about previously or what the plans are for this year. But that's just my, my gut feeling and take on it is that if it's gonna be something that's inclusive and really make sure that those histories are recognized, acknowledged and like thanked, 
then that's one thing. If it's just, you know, a town being like, hey, we're here and we're still here, that's cool. But it, again, there's a, a bit of erasure there as well, so. Thank you so much for um, elaborating on that. Um, so, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Beatty. I really appreciate hearing what you had to say. Um, uh, I, I have a, I, I feel like I've heard enough discussion to, to, to maybe vote, you know, from, from my perspective on, on some, uh, on some, uh, proposal or some motion rather. Um, but I also, want to raise this question for a future discussion um just because I, I just this this you know i i worry about who gets to say what's offensive and what's not offensive right i don't i don't in any way want to challenge that this is offensive to the indigenous population um but i wonder if you know so for example <clears throat> a white supremacist group uh finds a piece of work um offensive for uh you know for for celebrating diversity for example um what's the what's our you know what's the the the, the compass that we use to make a decision this is legitimate and this is not a legitimate response i would say number one that compass is going to be shaped by us, the equity committee. And if you look at um, compasses being shaped by everything from uh, NIA, uh, NIFA is doing some amazing progressive work. Um, we've reshaped community foundations work. What we basically are saying, and this is a long conversation, but the short of it is work needs to uplift marginalized communities, BIPOC communities. Um, and other marginalized communities. And white supremacy is not, does not uplift anything except white supremacy. So if a group of neo-Nazis wanna come up with something, then that's on them to do their own little stinky little art projects. And that's not anything that's gonna fly through us. You know, we will do this shaping, but that shaping comes from understanding that marginalized, traditionally marginalized communities like indigenous people, like us black folks, like us brown, brown folks, you know, the, the queer trans communities, all the, these communities need to be uplifted and made to feel at least that they're in a brave space. There may be no such thing as a safe space, but we can certainly create brave spaces where we all get to be seen and heard and people get to speak for themselves. Women should be able to say, these are our bodies, this is what we want. We black folks, black artists, we need to be able to say, this is anti-black. You don't get a comment in this. This is, you've had comments all along, white folks. Plantation days are done. This, I think, Communities need to be able to speak for themselves. And we who are not part of that community need to hear it and listen and uplift them as much as we possibly can. That's my belief. Um, I, I appreciate what you had to say. And I and I I don't really have any difficulty, you know, embracing it. I, I still think, you know, I, I still would like to engage in a conversation, you know, hearing all voices about, you know, uh, about this and hearing. And definitely, you know, the, the references that you, you know, seeing what other people are doing with establishing a, 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 a just a compass, I, you know, I, I look forward to exploring those. Um, I sent two documents. I did. I looked at them. I looked at them. They are incredibly rich. Uh, when I, when I go, when I start looking through those documents, the links, you know, it's like, it would be like months of schedule. I, I definitely need a guide to go through those, so. But it's not Pleasure. our job to guide you, right? I gave the links out because A, they come from the organizations that's funding us, the Bar Foundation, which is doing amazing work. The links are there. I mean, I'm not hurrying people to read them, but they're there and you can follow them and then et cetera, et cetera. I'm just saying, this is classic again, where white people are going, well, we need your help to do this. Uh-uh, 
you guys need to, we, you know, we need your help. We're exhausted. Help us help the indigenous folks, you know, Please. I think, I, Ken, Ken, I think, I think you're misconstruing what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not telling you, you need to do the work for me. I mean, the equity committee, it has taken on this task of guiding this through this process. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to, to lead me through the, the article. I know that there's, that's my work to do. Okay. I'm just talking about the pro applying it and figuring out where that, where it leads. But at any rate, that's a larger conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know where other people feel in terms of acting on the, the motion. Well, Mr. Beatty, do you want to, I see your hand went up. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to, um, you know, when you asked about like, how do you figure out like, you know, who's gets to say what's offensive? I think there's a few things at play, right? Context matters. What is the relationship with the people who are offended and the person or group that's doing, created the offense, right? Do, is there an actual interaction there or is this one group over here making up something or doing their thing and not considering this other group, right? Um, if, if I was to make art and it had women in it, you know, yeah, I have women in my family, but I don't, really in depth understand women's issues in the same way. So I might cross some boundaries. I might make some mistakes. I might do some things that are not, you know, appropriate. By the same token, I have no relationship with people from Sri Lanka. So if I'm making something and it affects them, I have to go, oh, well, wait a minute. Like I didn't know and I hadn't considered them. And that's on me. That's my mistake, right? I also think that, you know, if, there's a history there of marginalized or oppressed groups saying, hey, you know, you're, this, this hurts us, right? That has to be taken with a lot of serious consideration because I think so often, you know, the, the response is, oh, you guys are just making it up. You're offended by everything because it's easy for the other group, the group that isn't hurt by it to be dismissive, right? It, whether intentional or not, it's just easier to go, oh, you know, like I wasn't trying to hurt you, get over it. And that's what we've been told for years and years and years to get over these things. But they consistently happen, right? They remove the education about Native people in, in schools. They change what the history is around Black folks. They completely erase the contributions of women in science and medicine and all of these aspects. And then, and I don't, I'm not trying to imply that it's like a single group doing this. This is just the collective behavior of American society, right? These are the choices that we've kind of made. We're looking at these and we're going, wow, these people have kind of gotten stepped on and pushed down and whatever. Like, yeah, you know what? They have a right to be offended at a lot of stuff because a lot of stuff has happened to them. Right? They don't have the means necessarily or the power to defend themselves against these things. And so the concern is like, oh, you're gonna be offended by so many things. Well, you know what? It's unfortunately, a lot of times there's a lot of things to be, you know, to call out because people with power, regardless of who they are, are often dismissive of their treatment towards people without power. And so, you know, we have to start looking at those things. So I think if you're wondering about like, well, who gets to say what's offensive? You look at a situation, you look at the relationships between the two groups or three groups or however many, what are the power dynamics at play? And you know, the likelihood that people who are oppressed are going to speak out about stuff is rarely frivolous because we know the pushback, the, the, the punishment for doing it is, is often far greater than you know, what we're trying to get out of the offense. Most of the time we're just saying like, hey, don't do this thing. We're not saying you're a horrible person and, and you all suck and we hope you burn in a gas fire. No, we're saying like, look, can you just not treat me like a piece of trash and not do these things? And the problem becomes people with power, again, are, are dismissive. So I think if you're, look, if you're wondering where to start looking when there's a concern about who, who, you know, people get offended, I think those are the things you kind of have to look at. Thank you. Can we get a motion for something? Jesse's hands up. Go, Jess. 
Yeah, um, thank you so much for, for uh, elaborating on that. We really appreciate your presence here and all the thoughtful words that you've said to us so far this evening. Um, in light of the time, I would like to uh, come back to my original motion um, with just a quick comment beforehand saying that throughout this discussion, it kind of underlines to me the fact that um, this piece in question was chosen by the jury that we had, which brings into question for me, everything else that was chosen. Um, I would like to make a motion to cancel the biennial and whatever happens after that, is for another discussion and how to move forward from, from here. Jesse, to be super clear, just the visual arts biennial. Sorry, just the visual. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm at a split roads um, because the jurors for the poetry biennial were different. Um, nobody has come forward with any questions around it. Um, I don't know, I haven't done enough research to know whether or not the people that were chosen or the jurors that we had were coming from a different place than the visual um, jury. Ella submit to the, the, the poetry biennial. It was a poetry submission, right? I'm sorry, what? Is... Ella, who was on the call earlier oh, tonight, was. That's true, yeah. I mean, um, she was yeah. no, speaking they, more broadly, but. Yeah. Um, I know she was speaking more broadly, I, but I don't wanna make assumptions about I, yeah, and I also think it's gonna be problematic if we if we vote to cancel one and not cancel the other for a number of different reasons. So I'm just going to make it a, an umbrella cancellation of all biennial um, poetry and visual. I second that. Will those in favor raise your hand? Tulani, Amen, and Freeman are off. I, it's Tulani. I said I'm I'm in favor. Great. Amen. Do you want to uh, vote? No. Okay. Freeman. Well, we have four votes in favor of canceling. That is a majority that passes. Procedurally, right? Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Brian? We just Brian answered in the chat. Yes. Yeah, I see that. Yes, it would be uh, helpful if um, everyone on the council could help draft a statement um, uh, around the concerns that we had and why we decided to cancel the biennial. Um, I don't know what everyone's capacity is in the next 24 hours. Uh, to 48 hours, but um, we they, the show is supposed to be installed tomorrow. Um, so we could send out a cancellation notice um, and then maybe follow up in uh, a day or, or in two days with uh, the reasons why. Um, but there's definitely a lot of different um, uh, procedural things we'll have to do, but it would be uh, really helpful, I think, for the council to work together to draft something that is uh, one voice uh, on this particular uh, um, vote, which would be helpful. Um, can anyone get a draft started so we can work on that? 
um, and then um, I could uh, draft something to just make sure that we don't, you know, have anybody come install or anything like that uh, the next two days, just like a, a like a, a notice just to make sure that that doesn't happen. And then does anybody have any other ideas? That's my idea, my first idea, just procedurally. I think there, I think tonight, or like, I think tonight we should send an email that says the visual art and poetry biennial has been canceled. We will follow up with next steps mm -hmm. or like, okay. good. I, I would be happy to draft an initial state. My back is killing me right now. So I've got to go take some, some meds and put a new patch on, but uh, I can not tonight, but first thing in the morning, I'll get up in the morning and I can create like a Google doc that I just, you know, have everybody add to, I just br say briefly what it is and then folks can go on from there. I just, I don't have a long, typing is really difficult for me. I'm trying to keep my energy low so that I don't injure myself and end up being, but I'd be happy to draft that initial paragraph and then have folks fix it, change it, whatever. Okay. All right. Also, oh, I just, I want to say, so we're recording this for, for the minutes purposes. We had four yes votes to cancel. We had two no votes to cancel. I, I'm, I abstained from the vote. And I'm happy to discuss why at an, at, with anyone at any time. I'm glad that the biennial is canceled. I just want to say that. And I appreciate all the folks who came forward and um, shared opinions and, and voiced concerns and did all the emotional labor of being present, especially our Indigenous artists community for raising it, and especially the folks on the equity committee for organizing and presenting the, the motion. Um, so I want to just say appreciations for that, but I want to make sure that that's documented for, for Kathy when we have to have the minutes written up. Um, we, we had two other things. We had one other thing on the agenda tonight. Is it all right if, if I make a motion to close the meeting? Yep. Yes. And, sorry, um, Brian. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, and in terms, so before I do that, sorry, we're going to send a cancellation notice out tonight there. And then that notice will go to any press that has already been informed the artists and any partners that have already been informed. So any food and beverage partners, Brian's working on it and the library. If anyone, I think that email should probably come from arts at Northampton, uh, art.gov. That'll come from Brian's account. And any questions should probably be directed to the general Northampton arts email address. And Brian can answer them using the statement that we're all working on together. And if there is a response, like Brian, you can even set an out of office responder that says the Northampton biennial has been canceled. We'll follow up with details soon um, or whatever we want to say. So that I don't, I don't, the point is, I don't think that any individual one of us members should be responding to inquiry requests because we don't actually have a con concise narrative about that yet. And Ellen, I know that might put you in a difficult position as someone who's already been working closely with the artists. But I think just to, if you do get questions, just to say that basically mirror the language from Brian that the council is working on more information, please stay tuned okay. or direct people to the, to Brian's email address. That would be, I think that's the best course of action. Does that make sense to folks? Yes. Brian, you'll be in touch with Faith. Brian, is he there? Yeah, I think he's drafting email. Um, Brian. Yeah, I'll email Faith and Karen and Kathy um, uh, about it. And then um, I'm emailing all the users of our call right now that submitted to the to the, to the biennial. Um, and then I will draft an email. I'm using our call as the for the sort of for the mass email just to cancel it. I'm gonna pull all the pages down and then I'm gonna email all the um, juried in artists for poetry and visual arts from my 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 particular my specific email with a similar message so if the art call email gets caught in the junk um and then you can forward or, forward any uh inquiries to my email and then i'll uh, use the council's draft that gets um hopefully uh drafted in the next 48 hours 
uh, to do everything we need to do. All right. Can we set a time that we have that draft completed by, let's say, 7 p.m. on Thursday? Uh, if that's possible for everybody, that would be great. If that's doable. Um, I'm going to get on. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Are there any last questions or action items that we need to address around the cancellation? Um, I'm one of your marketing partners. I have a marketing coordinator that was going to promote the event. I would, I'm have, I'm going to pull it, but my only like flag is Brian. If there are any other people that are like sending emails about it, if you want me to reach out to anyone, I'm happy to do that as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll loop you in. I'm just going to go and try to work on all this right now. Yeah, they'll need to be. Yeah. Ready. I'm going to draft the, I'm okay. just going to stay up and draft the initial paragraph and put it up now so that everybody has a chance to look at it in the morning or whatever times you all look at it, all right? So I'll just put it up as a Google Doc for everybody. Thank you, Kent. All right. Thank you, Kent. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, motion to close the municipal meeting. Seconded. All in favor. All right, our municipal meeting is closed and I'm gonna suggest that we don't open an ink meeting tonight. Is that okay, Brian? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you everyone for, oh, sorry, Eamon. No, uh, that was just seconding to end. Oh, great. <laughs> um, wonderful. Thanks everyone. I hope you have a, a restful rest of your evening. Thank you everybody for the struggling through this. Good night. Good night. Thank you everyone.